titled How Reagan's Embrace of Greed is Good Brought Us Broken Airplane Doors and Being on Hold for Hours. And, you know, the, the bottom line you know, this is a very straightforward story, actually. And that is that historically, and by historically, I'm talking about from the Republican, from the, from the Republican Great Depression in the 19, early 1930s, right up until the Reagan Revolution in 1981, the CEOs of companies all across America, number one, were not particularly engaged in politics. That you know, came post-Powell memo. And number two, were running their companies in ways that were generally good for America. Working people, in that period of time, from 1932 to 1981, working people saw their wages and their wealth grow more rapidly than the top 1%, more rapidly than the morbidly rich, the top 1,000th of 1%. And the reason why is because businesses were run with five constituencies in mind. Number one, the customer. Are we doing what's right for the customer? Well, it doesn't seem like that's happening anymore, right? Have you, have you sat on hold for an hour waiting to talk to a customer service representative someplace? Um, uh, one of my kids bought a brand new car and she got it out on the freeway and it died and it sat in four months uh, before finally she got a lawyer and using Oregon's lemon law got her money back and got rid of the car. And, but I, and, then, and then a friend of theirs, the same thing happened to him like two weeks ago. I mean, you know, it's like, and the, the infuriating part is both the dealer and the automaker just give them the runaround continuously. I mean, you know, this is, this is just normal now. Stores jettisoning clerks, cutting staff to increase profit for shareholders, all this kind of stuff. So we have, you know, we're, we're witnessing essentially the death of service in America. But where did this come from? So number, you know, as I said, CEOs used to understand that they, they had an obligation to these five groups, to their customers, I just mentioned, they don't feel that any longer, to, their, to, their, to the institution of the company itself, in other words, to keep this uh, corporation that is, you know, a part of the community viable and growing, to the community, to their workers, I mean, this is just like the, the basic stuff, right? That, that, that this is the, the customers, the workers, the local community, the institution, the corporation itself, and finally, the shareholders. The CEOs have an obligation to the shareholders. Well, what happened in the 1980s was Ronald Reagan tried to put Robert Bork on the Supreme Court, and he got Borked. He got exposed as a racist, homophobe uh, bigot. And so, you know, the, the Democratic senators uh, would not go along with Reagan's appointment of Bork. But Reagan went along with Bork's number one project, which had been a 15-year project that Robert Bork had been working on, which was changing corporate governance laws in America. He wanted to do two things. He wanted the Reagan administration to stop enforcing the antitrust laws because he said, you know, if you wipe out a uh, hundred or a thousand small local businesses, Say Walmart, you know, comes into, into five new towns and wipes out 500 new businesses. According to Bork, that's a good thing because each one of those businesses had their own bookkeeper. Now Walmart only needs one bookkeeper, so they can, you know, a whole bunch of bookkeepers get laid off. Each one of those businesses had all their salespeople. That now they only need one sales team, so a bunch of salespeople get laid off. All those businesses had, you know, separate buildings that were rented, but they only need one building. So, all, you know, and, and Bork says this is a good thing because it makes the, the Walton family fabulously rich. It makes, you know, the big, the big corporate, do, the dominant corporations fabulously rich. And, and the second thing that Robert Bork wanted, in addition to ending enforcement of the antitrust laws, and this was arguably the big one, is he wanted an end to sh share buybacks having been criminalized. Back in 1935, Joe Kennedy was running the Securities and Exchange Commission, and he, and I mean, he knew this from inside experience, right? He got, yeah. You know, Joe Kennedy was one of the few guys who actually got rich during the Great Depression, and he did it in part through stock manipulation. And so, what he did was he outlawed that very stock manipulation, which is where a company buys back their own shares. All it does is jack up the price of the shares, which only helps the CEO, the senior executives, and the shareholders. And it screws everybody else. It reduces the company's ability to develop new products. It reduces the pay available to workers. 
it reduces the taxes paid into the local community. I mean, it's just right across the board. So Bork got these two things passed. By 1983, Reagan had bought both of Bork's policies. And in 82, he, he decriminalized share buybacks. And in 83, he told the Department of Justice, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the Federal Trade Commission to stop enforcing the antitrust laws in the United States. And as a result, you know, here we are. We've got, we've got a handful of giant corporations that dominate little, literally every industry in America. And every time the CEO wants to pull another $50 million out of the company, he just buys back, you know, a, a billion dollars worth of shares. And the value of all the stock that he's sitting on or she is sitting on suddenly goes up and they just cash in some of that and, you know, take the money and run. And meanwhile, you and I, with our lemon cars and our sitting on hold for an hour with the airlines and, and our paying, you know, $1,000 for a pharmaceutical that costs $50 in, in, uh, in, in Canada. I mean, literally, we're talking like, like uh, you know, insulin here. We get screwed. But this is Robert Bork's America. I thought one, one comment about Bork was particularly prescient. Ted Kennedy, in, this was 1987, keep in mind. This was almost 40 years ago. Ted Kennedy describing Donald Trump's America. He said, and I quote, Robert Bork's America. This was in response to Reagan wanting to put Bork on the court, 1987. Robert Bork's America is a land in which women would be forced into back alley abortions. Blacks would sit at segregated lunch counters. Rogue police could break down citizens' doors in midnight raids. School children could not be taught about evolution. Writers, writers and artists could be censored at the whim of the government. And the doors of the federal courts would be shut on the fingers of millions of citizens for, the whom, for whom the judiciary is and is often the only protector of the individual rights that are at the heart of our democracy. End quote. So what, oh, and, and finally, what I'm pointing out is that um, president Joe Biden is the first American president since 1981 to actually reject neoliberalism. Carter went along with it. Clinton, well, sort of in the last two years, Clinton went and embraced it. Obama embraced it. And Biden is going, no, these guys were wrong. We're going to, we're going to reject this Republican light stuff. And so Biden is actually trying to, he, I mean, they're, they're forbidding, you know, for, they, just, they just stopped, what was it, Spirit and JetBlue, or was it JetBlue in Alaska? They just stopped a couple of big airline mergers. They're, they're using an antitrust action against Google. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff going on right now. It's pretty good stuff that the Biden administration is doing. So I wanted to flag that for you and you know, let your members of Congress know that you support, number one, the Biden administration's taking on monopolies in America. But number two, um, a, a legislative effort to outlaw share buybacks. Because I'm telling you, share buybacks are at the core of an awful lot of our problems. 